Today we begin a new study of the Word of God. We're in 2 Peter chapter 1 and Simon Peter is the author of this epistle. It, like 2 Timothy, is more personal in nature, but it contains the heart of this great apostle of the Lord, and it is beneficial to our instruction. The theme of 2 Peter is growing in grace, and we in these three chapters look at the growth and progress of the Christian life. We want to read the 21 verses of 2 Peter 1, but before we do, we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father, we come into your presence and we ask and commit our way into your hands, asking that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge in the life of our Savior. Oh Lord, may we not live for ourselves, but oh Lord, may we live for you and may you live in us. Give us that which we cannot produce. And Lord, our tired and weary and thirsty hearts, wait for thy presence and thy strength and thy provision and thy direction. Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God may have His way, that you may bless in the, the exposition of this chapter, that you may teach us things that we need to know, that you may remind us of that which is important. Work your will, we pray, and honor your Son. And may we grow in grace May we journey through life. May we progress towards maturity. Lord, your will be done. Give us thy grace today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned just the other week that I looked in the back of my pickup truck and was amazed to see where dirt had accumulated and I had hauled some uh, bark in the last year or two that grass was growing in the back of my pickup truck. It was a couple of inches high and looked green and lot living. And, uh, since then I've gotten in the back of the truck and cleaned it up a little and the grass is gone. But The grass in my pickup truck illustrates the point. It, it is not only necessary to grow, but it's important where we grow. And of course in the parable of Matthew 13, in the, the sower, though the sower scattered seed everywhere, and God in His witness and in His work scatters seed everywhere in this world. And He can make it grow. And he wants all men to have opportunity to do his will. Remember that it wasn't the hard packed soil of the wayside, nor the soil around the briars and the, the growth of the underbrush. It wasn't the, soil, uh, the seed sown in the shallow soil but it was the seed sown in the cultivated field that grew and continued in life and produced fruit according to purpose. And we need to grow in grace and it is the challenge of this chapter and it is the challenge of our lives that we don't stop growing and that we grow in the things that are important to God. 
and in this in our body in those cells which grow at such an abnormal rate that they gobble up the other cells around them and we call that growth cancer and that must be eliminated by surgery surgery or therapy or medicine or else it will cause great harm and today we look at this first chapter and say that our growth our growth needs to be the way the Lord wants it to be it needs to be pleasing to him it needs to be directed by his spirit it needs to be through the power and person of his son it needs to be energized by faith and there's a way and a place and a manner in which we are to grow grace is Jesus in action grace is what we cannot produce and do not deserve grace is God's merited faith unmerited favor upon our lives his gift to us and in Peter's mind and in the mind of the writers of the New Testament that was how growth is needed in the Christian's life and so today we say you must grow in grace and how can we do that well we want to read the first 21 verses of this chapter and we want to see how we can grow in grace Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue by which are we given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and besides this giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these be in you and abound, they make you that you need be, shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always into remembrance of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Yea, I think it fitting as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that I must shortly put off this my tabernacle, even as the Lord Jesus has shown me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice was <clears throat> came from heaven. We heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. 
unto the which ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star shall arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not at any time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You must grow in grace, and how can you do that? Well, Peter tells us in this first chapter of this second epistle, we can grow in grace and we must do that by letting Jesus live his life through us. And we see that in verses 3 through 10. And here Simon Peter describes the Christian life as a necklace chain of jewels and virtues. And so he says that we have received the divine nature. We have the God of glory living within us. And we have escaped the corruption and the sin of the unbelieving world around us. And we have been born again. And we have been changed by the salvation that we received in Christ. And now we're growing and letting him live his life through us. And we have these great promises, these great virtues, this great necklace of the faith. And, and Peter says that we need to give diligence to put these virtues together and, and that they grow and that we develop. And one virtue helps another virtue. And so that we add to our faith goodness and knowledge and self-control and patience, and godliness, and kindness, and love. Here is the character of Christ. Here is fruits likened to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Here is that which you cannot achieve from the flesh, from your own efforts, from your own doings, from your own strivings, from your own disciplines. This does not come from us. It comes from God. But God has given us the person of His Son to live within us. He has given us the ministry of the Holy Spirit to lift Christ up. And so we can grow in these virtues. We can develop in these characteristics. We can let Jesus live His life through us today. It is really all about Him, you know, and we say that so often, and it's so important because in our thinking, in our focus, in the way that we live, though we say that sometimes, we end up living for something or someone else. And God would bless me today. He loves me. He wants what's best for me. God would have me grow. And a baby does not, that does not grow is an abnormal thing. It is a sad thing if that occurs. And though we wish we could keep them small and sweet, we want them to grow up so that they will be able to care for themselves and understand life and accomplish that which God has put in their lives in His creation. And God would have us to grow up, to develop strength, to be responsible, adult, mature Christians in the faith. And if we're going to do that, we're going to have to grow in the knowledge, in the characteristics, in the life, in the doing of the person of Christ. And we're going to have to see God's will and God's blessing and God's opportunities it's not for ourselves and our self-gratification. It's not so that we can be comforted. It's not so that we can be at ease. It's not so we can pile up a lot of money for personal use. It's not so that we can be honored in our achievements. It's that we may know more of Him and that we might help others through His life and that we might honor God 
by letting him do his work in our life. And so growth in grace, it's important. Where are we grow? That we grow in Christ. That we grow in the knowledge of him. And Peter says that if we do not develop these virtues, and if we do not live in the power of Christ, and we forget these things, then our old nature and the sins of the old nature may take hold of us. And here is a warning that we all need to observe at many points in our Christian life. We do not disbelieve in the salvation of our Lord or the truth of the Scripture. We believe that salvation is eternal and secure in Christ. But friend, we want to make sure that we are really in Him. And so, check your life today. God would have you to. See if you be in the faith. And know that you're trusting in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone to take away your sin. You remember when you began to trust in Him and the change that took place in your life. You know that now, it is not your work or your virtue or your doing at the church or your work or your achievement in life or your great understanding or, or having overcome some of the problems that other men are dragged down with. It is the death of God's Son in your behalf that secures and keeps and maintains your salvation and your hope and your trust and your allegiance is to Him and to nothing or anyone else. There is a way that we are to grow. And there is a way that we are to live. And Simon Peter knew that way. And he says very clearly and plainly that we are to grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is His life in us that is our life as a Christian. It is His goodness and His strength and His power and His plan and His will. And then if we're going to grow in grace, we need to remember what salvation is and what it accomplishes in 11 through 15. Now in these short verses, just these few verses, I counted four or five times that you have the word remember or remembrance. And Simon Peter knows he's coming to the end of his life. He knows he's soon going to be martyred. And so there's some things that are on his mind as he writes to people who have trusted Jesus Christ and their Christian life. And Simon Peter knows the value of remembering what God has done and what we have learned. Now we cannot live in that thing we call the past. We cannot change what yesterday was, good or bad, accomplishments or failures, sin or victories. We cannot go back and live it again. We cannot change it. We should not live in the glory of the past. But we can look back and remember for today what we have learned and what God has taught us in the past. Say, Christian, do you remember that time in your Christian life that, that your life was full of the zeal and energy and purpose of God, that His love was fresh and new in your heart, and you were working and, and looking for His will, but you settled down now and you've lost that, and you're comfortable in your routine and the joy has faded away. And sometimes that happens in a Christian's life. And we need to remember and grow in the grace of our Lord. We need to remember and may we never forget what a marvelous and wonderful thing our Lord did for us. When he died on the cross in our place. And he brought us to faith and knowledge of him. It, it must be what our life is all about. It must be the goal to which we press. It must be the God in whom we trust. 
It must be the end and the beginning and the power and the middle and the reason and the cause and the doing of all of our growth and our living, of all of our work and our purpose. But I fear that the church has lived in the flesh and veered from the person of Christ and we have forgotten what that sweet love and fellowship with our Lord was like and how much we need it and how much He must mean to us. Remember. Remember. And friend, if you are to grow, you must remember what God has taught you. You must remember what He has done for you. And Simon Peter would not let us forget it. He puts it in the focal point. And he emphasizes it here. And then if we're going to grow in grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we need to do so in 16 through 21 by trusting the teachings of the Word of God. Now Simon Peter says a very remarkable thing. Remember, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John. He visibly saw the glory of God the Father in the cloud. He saw the glory of the person of Jesus Christ. He saw him talking to Moses and Elijah there on the mount. He saw that Jesus, who was a man whom he had touched and lived around, was also God. He saw that and he heard the voice. But Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And let those like the charismatics who would put all their emphasis upon experience and something they can feel and think and imagine and hope and wish and dream that is the work of God. Let them read the Word of God and see that, it, that the truth of God's Son and His life and His growth is anchored in the truth of this book. So that Simon Peter would say, we have a more sure word of prophecy than that which we have experienced. And this word of prophecy is the word that reveals the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and His work and His will. It's what it's all about, Simon Peter would say. And we don't just have to remember our experiences, though we do, and they're glorious and they're wonderful. We walk by faith and we trust the teaching of this book and we study it and find out what God has said. And whether we like it or not, we yield and do and trust and live by the principles of this book. And I tell you, we fundamentalists in all of our boastful knowledge and all of our assuming that we are believing the truth. We need to go back and look and see what this Word really teaches. Because we too have based so much of our hope upon who we are and what we can do and what we have experienced and what we have been taught. And it is not sufficient food for the growth of grace in the knowledge of Him. God gave us this word because he knew it was vital and we needed it and we are kept and preserved by it. We are fed and directed by it. We are empowered and reminded by it. And we must never neglect it nor its truth. And it was not of any private interpretation. The Roman Catholics have it wrong. They are not the vicars of Christ to interpret and tell other people what the Word of God means. It is not my uh, private interpretation that determines the truth. It is the evidence of what God has said. And it, it, I come to the Word of God and submit to its authority. And God so gave this Word. And we have this blessed Scripture here. That, that prophecy in the Scripture did not come by the will of the ma of man alone. God used men in their personalities and their backgrounds and they, they wrote from 
their point of view, but God directed them from the Holy Spirit and kept them from sin and error and caused them to write only what He wanted them to write. They weren't uh, oblivious to God's working and writing in their, through their hearts and their minds, but God preserved the Word so that it was exactly what He wanted us to have and to know. And we have this marvelous thing of the inspiration of Scripture. Every part of it is what God wants us to know. Every part of it can be counted on to be true. And this is the claim of Scripture for itself. It is the claim of the Word of God. It is the claim of the God of the Word. That He, through the Holy Spirit, authored this book and so moved and guided men that what we have is what He breathed out and caused men to write. We have so many movements today. And so many of them are based upon emotionalism and human thinking and human philosophies. And their growth, though they attract many and perhaps they are not all bad. Perhaps some of them do some good. Our growth must be upon and with and by and through the Word of God. And so Peter reminds us here that we must grow in grace, but that grace involves Growing through and in and by and with the life of Jesus as He lives through us and in us and produces the Christian life. That these virtues should grow and develop and be maintained to maturity. And that if they're not, that may be an evidence that we're certainly out of the will of God or maybe we aren't even saved if these things are not present at all in our life. And so we're to check out our hope and the basis of our, our belief. And we're to grow in grace. We're to remember what Jesus has done for us. And remember what He has taught us. And we are to live by not just trusting our experience and what we remember, but we are to live by knowing and feeding and reading and living and believing the Word of God, the truth of this book. Is it your only rule of faith and practice today? I trust that it is. It must be. And if it is, God will cause us to grow up in Him. To let the life of the Lord Jesus develop and produce results in our lives for all eternity. For His glory and His praise and our good today. I pray that it may be so. Are you growing today? And are you growing how and where God wants you to grow? Amen.